I'm going to boil all what I, all, my whole story about public health for a lay audience, not a room full of, you know, sort of physical activity and healthy design kind of nerds like you guys. I love you. You're my peeps. But we're the outliers. So here's the easy way to tell the story. Three numbers, 30, 23, 65. 30 is the minutes per day we're told we should be physically active. It's why they used it in that study, why they tried to get people to get about 30 minutes a day. We know kids leak more like an hour a day. These are minimum recommendations. Unfortunately, the 20 is uh, at most the percentage of Americans actually meeting those guidelines, maybe 20%. The 365, what do you think that is? Days of the year, oh, so we wish. How about 365,000 premature deaths annually due to physical inactivity and poor nutrition? Second only to tobacco, which kills about 450,000. So those, as I said, are the big three that cause premature illness and death. So these are really compelling numbers because I think most people don't have a sense of the magnitude. The national guidelines, that 30 minutes per day is actually conveyed as a recommendation to average about 150 minutes a week. Again, the dose they used in that study. But they say if you could get a half an hour, five days of the week, you'd be meeting the guideline. There are a couple important things about the recommendations. It doesn't have to be all at once. It can be broken up. So the person who, for example, walks 10 minutes to the bus stop in the morning, they work in an area where they can go walk 10 minutes for errands at lunch to the bank, to the post office, and then walk back from the bus 10 minutes in the afternoon. That accumulated 30 minutes confers the benefit of reduced risk for cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, osteoporosis, clinical depression, dementia in old age, a growing list of cancers. In other words, pretty much all of the things that, cause, uh, that undermine our quality of life are reduced by getting this moderate daily dose. That's the good news. This seems pretty attainable. By the way, kids need more like an hour a day. And there's one more point. These are minimum recommendations. The research suggests there's what we call a dose response. So if we can get a person more physical activity, they get more benefit. The risk reduction is even greater. Wow, that sounds great. This graph actually shows that second number, the 20% there, that get that on an average daily basis or weekly basis. That is five days, uh, 30 minutes, five days of the week. Two notable things. It's an overestimate because it's based on self-report data that the Centers for Disease Control collects based on telephone surveys. And when they actually put measurement devices on people's hips, like pedometers, what you find is the numbers are probably closer to 10% of kids and maybe as few as 5% of adults actually meeting the guidelines. That's mind-blowing, right? In a room full of people. Does anybody ride their bike here tonight? Or walk? Yeah, see, when you have that, you know, a room full of you, that's not, you know, again, we're the outliers. We're nothing like with the population at large, what the data tells us. And we've got to recognize that. The second thing about this line, perhaps more disconcerting than whether it's really 10% or 20%, it's this really small number in the population. Worse than that, it's dead flat. Whatever we've been doing for the last 20 years is not getting more people more physical activity. Very frustrating for a person who spent the last 20 years of their life trying to convince people to be more physically active. TV shows, books, video, all that stuff, no avail. I think it's because of the stickiness problem. I think that we actually know what the problem is here and we've been taking the wrong attack, wrong approach. So one more little bit of kind of geeky public health data. This is an intervention study in which they tried to get people to walk 40 minutes a day. So just get out for a 40-minute walk. And there were actually three groups in this study, too. One group was told, walk your 40 minutes all at once. One was told you could break it into four 10-minute walks. And the third group was told you can break it into four 10-minute walks, and we're going to put a treadmill in your house. Wow, piece of cake, right? Just jump on 10 minutes anytime you have time. So over six months, it's a year and a half long study, but the first six months is the intervention period. So they do things like call you up and give you email reminders. They teach you how to warm up before your walks and how to stretch afterwards and how to select a good walking shoe so you don't get injured. They give you an exercise diary, and if you fill it out and turn it in, you get prizes, like a t-shirt or a water bottle, because we love giving away t-shirts and water bottles in health promotion. We really do. And in fact, we do it in walk to work, walk to school day and bike to work week. Who here has been involved in either the giving or receiving of t-shirts, water bottles, fanny packs, baseball hats, or a related swag for being more physically active, riding or walking. Wait, get those hands up there, right? So almost everybody in the room, one way or the other, probably both. Over the six months, it works. Doing that kind of stuff gets people to be more physically active. But that's actually not the interesting health question, right? From a public health standpoint, the question is, what happens after the intervention is over? And I leave you to your own devices. So I want everybody in the room to vote for one of these three orange arrows, because it represents the trend for the whole group in the study. And I'm going to give you inside information. Before you vote, I'm going to tell you that right here at six months, 
they had statistically significant increases in aerobic fitness and decreases in weight. So let me say it again. They were losing weight and they were more fit. Wow, so it was starting to work. Now based on that, everybody in the room vote for one of the three arrows. How many think they continued to increase their activity? Increase their activity. Nobody? Really? How many think that they at least maintained their activity, that the flat arrow went out there and they maintained it? Good. I like your positive attitudes. <laughs> And how many think it dropped off? How many of you? Well, you all have a horrible attitude, and we should send you out, except for one tiny thing, which is, of course, that you're right. Now, we don't have lots of these intervention trials because they normally end right here and declare victory. But the studies that actually carry on beyond the intervention, beyond the walk-to-work week or bike-to-work week or walk-to-school event, or, they show this problem, which I call the stickiness problem. Behavior change alone doesn't stick. We can get short-term results, but it doesn't, that, that, the line should go out like that, ideally, from a public health standpoint, right? Or from a transportation standpoint, if I'm trying to shift behavior, whatever. It's the stickiness problem. Now, I have a solution. I am looking for a community in which to pilot this. I will someday be famous for this. It's an acronym. They will someday call this the Fenton Pappy Program. And if you think this might be good for here, I'd like somebody to speak to me afterwards. We have two mayors. If either of you think this would be appropriate for your communities, it's um, the Pappy Program. It stands for Physical Activity Promotion Through Predator Introduction. <laughs> and I think this is going to work great. And what we do is reintroduce our natural predators back into our living environment, and we get a lot of high-intensity physical activity, largely anaerobic. Uh, I think it would be fantastic. Unfortunately, I've had no takers yet. So I actually presented this for the Centers for Disease Control. This is true. I was at a conference at the CDC in Atlanta, and I suggested this. One of the doctors said, Fenton, that's kind of interesting because it's sort of Darwinian, isn't it? And I said, that's right, because you don't have to be able to run faster than the bear, just the guy you're with. <laughs> You've heard that before, right? You knew that was coming. So, it, but it does. We call the less active from the herd. I think it would work great. And you know, you would come into a meeting like this and be, I gotta tell you, that mountain lion that they released on Western, that thing is fast. I uh, got a stitch. So, no funding there. I guess I'm gonna have to go with what the behavioral psychologists would call a socio-ecological approach. There's really interesting research in this field, actually. And what we find is it's not a matter of just um, telling people and giving them the individual skills. That's good to do, but it's not sufficient. A socio-ecological approach suggests that other cues in your life have to be directing you toward the behavior if we really want to see population level shift. Um, so family and friends, the institutions that are important to you, like your school or your workplace or your healthcare provider, the community by its physical design, like the actual infrastructure and even public policy. You will sometimes see this drawn as a series of circles, the individual at the middle, family and friends around them, and a series of rings. Uh, the problem with that is it doesn't recognize the fact that I believe these are foundational. That's why I draw it as a pyramid, because I think this pyramid doesn't stay up if you aren't making the changes at the policy and at the community design level. The other stuff just won't work, and that's what the problem has been with physical activity. We have been telling people to exercise and even setting up walking groups at workplaces and doing things like that, but what we haven't done, or walking school buses at schools, for example, that's that's great, but they're not sticky if the foundation isn't there. We haven't built an environment to make. Now, do we have examples of this in public health? Absolutely. One of our great successes is tobacco, right? Where we don't just say, don't smoke, it's bad for you. We've made it hard to smoke in public places. We've taxed the daylights out of the product, right? I, you know, when I was a competitive athlete, I had to ask for seating in the non-smoking section of an airplane. Do you guys remember what that meant? Remember the imaginary line? I was in front of it, the smokers were behind it, and there went the smoke. So, my kids will never be exposed to that, not because when we get on an airplane, we go to the top of the pyramid and we say, hey, everybody, we'd love it if you didn't smoke. There are young people on the plane. It's bad for their health. It's because the law says you screw around with the smoke detector in the bathroom, they land the plane, and state troopers will take you off. Right? I'm not making that up. That's what we've done as a society. We've decided to collect it. And so any of these are examples of sort of a shift toward changing the actual policy structure and infrastructure of our communities. So... The question you ought to ask is, can we do that around physical activity? And I believe yes, but it's not going to be putting a gymnasium in every workplace or a treadmill in every house. Because even in that study, remember in the study, the people had a treadmill. One third of the people had a treadmill in their house. And at the end of it, apparently, they were hanging wet laundry on it because they weren't walking anymore. Do you remember the study? Okay, 12 slides ago? Okay, so what we got to do is build a world where this happens, where being physically active happens as a part of daily life. And I think incidental or routine or functional physical activity, walking, biking, transit, is our most hopeful way there. 
that's where our best opportunity is to get the other 80% of the population, right? The 20 that aren't, not the 20 that are willing to go to the gym, work out, ride their bikes here tonight, but the rest. 